I am Planta on the line in Vancouver at thecommentary.ca. Natalie McLean joins me now. The award-winning wine critic is uh, widely read, having uh, millions of readers in print, and over 100,000 people uh, subscribe to her e-newsletter, which you can sign up for at uh, nataliemcclain.com. On the said website, there are uh, all sorts of neat things, such as phone apps and the sort, as well as reviews of all sorts of wine. She's the author of a new book, too, Unquenchable, A Tipsy Quest for the World's Best Bargain Wines. It's a highly readable book that's part guide and part memoir to all sorts of places, Germany, Australia, Italy, Argentina, Portugal, South America, and here in Canada. I've uh, just started reading it, and as I've uh, said when another wine writer was on, I don't have a taste for wine, but in her uh, lively, witty prose, she makes the search for these bargain wines fun and fascinating. Natalie McLean's previous book, Red, White, and Drunk All Over, was a bestseller and critically lauded. She's in Vancouver now, but will return later this month in uh, uh, pardon me, later this month, Monday the 21st of November 2011 at the Fairmont Pacific Rim. For the price of admission, there'll be wine and cheese and uh, a copy of uh, this new book. Visit ticketweb.ca for more information and tickets. The book is published by Doubleday. Please uh, welcome to the Plant Online program, Natalie McLean. Good morning, Ms. McLean. Hi, Joe. How are you? Pretty good yourself. I'm great, thanks. So the um, the event on the 21st, what happens that night? Is it? Well, there's going to be lots of uh, good wines and cheeses. We're going to do a, um, a variety of different pairings um, during the evening, and then interspersed with that, I'll be reading um, selected passages from the book. Um, I I hope, the more amusing ones to, yeah. to entertain people, but uh, it should be a nice uh, pairing of, of wine and words that night. Yeah, and um, the, the, you're doing events like the, the, these uh, throughout the country, right? I am, yes. This um, book tour has been planned around uh, a series of wine bars and wine tastings, but I think that's a natural fit because I think that obviously the people who are interested in reading about wine don't want to hear about it and uh, not be tasting something along the way. So it's been a lot of fun. Um, so rather than going the traditional bookstore route, we decided to, to hold these in other venues. And, and how are wine drinkers in Canada? Are they savvy? Are we becoming more informed? Absolutely. Um, you know, I think what goes hand-in-hand hand with uh, wine appreciation is the development of your own wine industry. And ours, uh, both in the Okanagan and Niagara in particular, uh, have developed uh, in a phenomenal, to a phenomenal degree, both in quality and the number of wineries. And so I think we're coming to, we're, we're developing a stronger wine culture in part because of that. But also I think a lot of people are coming to wine because it's just so much easier to learn about wine these days. And in an unintimidating way, like through Twitter or Facebook or online, it's just easy to, you know, trade recommendations and pairings and that sort of thing. So I think that combination of factors is why wine consumption is increasing and wine appreciation as well. And how do our wines uh, stack up to, to those internationally? They, they stack up um, just fine. In fact, I think our wines, um, again, particularly in the Okanagan and Niagara, are bargains. And people always look twice at me when I say that because they're not dirt cheap. Uh, uh, you know, a Pinot Noir especially, which is called the heartbreak grape because it's difficult and expensive to make, but when we make it, it's sublime when it works. You know, we live in a really cool climate, but the prices are going to start at twenty twenty five dollars But if you want that comparable quality from Burgundy, France, you're going to pay double or triple for a Pinot Noir of that quality. So I do think we make terrific wines, but we have a higher cost of production, living in a challenging climate just as France does. That will translate, though, into the quality. Where is home for you, Natalie? Um, well, I was... Uh, b- I was raised on the East Coast, just outside of Halifax, and yeah. now um, I've been living in Ottawa for about 12 years now. Yeah. How much of the uh, time uh, did you spend traveling? For the book, um, the past five years has been, you know, writing and researching and traveling, because in every um, chapter, it's a different country. There right. are eight of them. Yeah. And so I would go at least for about 10 days, two weeks, and meet about 40 50 wineries, and really spend time hanging out with these people so that I could get a story uh, that would be compelling. And I would pick the three that I thought were the most interesting people, because I think in telling the story of people who are passionate about making wine, you can tell the story of wine itself in a, in a more interesting way. And so I've listed some of the countries that you take us to in this book. Is there a, a place that you hadn't been to previously that you really wanted to go to? 
Yes, Argentina. I think it's just the combination of of the culture, the beauty of the land, the Andes, the you know stark desert, the tango, Buenos Aires being like Paris of South America, the big steakhouses because Argentine beef is tradition, um, and then the luscious Malbecs, that fleshy red wine that they produce. It was just a, a feast for the senses. Yeah, and was there a place that you uh, had been to before that you really wanted to go back to? Um, I think, you know, France is always a favorite of mine. Um, I, I don't drink Bordeaux and Burgundy on a regular basis anymore because they're too expensive, but I went down into southern France. For this uh, book, I went to Provence, where they make the, the bone-dry rosés that are refreshing and beautiful, but equally, the Languedoc, southern France, produces robust red wines that are terrific bargains, and that's kind of one of the insider tips. Look for the most, uh, the least or the less fashionable regions of a country that's well known for wine. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, we're coming up to Christmas, and, and wine always makes a good gift. Um, what should we look for if we're looking to, to, to buy a bunch of wine that we can bring to dinner parties and sort of or hand off if, to the neighbors or something like that, something that we can keep on hand? Sure. Well, if you know their taste, that's always a good starting point, like whether it's red, white, full-bodied, light. Um, A lot of us, though, take a bottle of wine without knowing that information. Um, And so I always recommend uh, what I call switch hitter wines, which are wines that appeal to different palates, so um, both those who like full-bodied and light. And specifically, Pinot Noir is one of them, Mm -hmm. and Riesling is the other. And we do those both of those wines very well in... um, BC and Ontario, and the reason why um, they appeal to so many people is they're packed with flavor, but they're not heavy in alcohol and tannin and oak. So you really, those are safe bets, and um, they make lovely gifts because they go well uh, with turkey as well. Mm -hmm. And in in terms of of what a bargain wine is, I mean, how much are we, we talking about here? I think these days you can find terrific wines in the ten to fifteen dollar range. Mm-hmm. You can splurge up to seventeen, but you really can find wines that taste twice as expensive as they cost. And you know, there's a variety of factors why. Uh, from some of the ones that we've already mentioned, like less fashionable regions trying to make an inroad into the market, but you know, technology has improved, bringing costs down. Uh, there are new regions always wanting to compete. It's never been a better time to be a wine shopper. And, and so that, that obviously means that higher prices doesn't necessarily mean higher quality, right? Exactly. So I, I don't think it's a linear relationship in that, you know, a $100 bottle is 10 times better than a $10 one. Um, I think there's a cutoff, call it 30 or $50, where above that, you're not paying for the cost of production solely. You're paying for intangibles like rarity or a high critic score collectability. So in other words, you're not paying for what you get, you're paying for what somebody else wants. And um, so that's why I think in that price range of 10 to 15 or 17, you can get some fantastic bottles these days. Um, I've, I've had um, another one of your colleagues on this program before, he's been on twice actually, um, talking about wine, and I've, I've told him that I, I don't I don't drink wine, I don't have a taste for it, I guess, I just don't like it. I mean, I'm, I'm 29 years old. Do you think I can develop one at this age? There's still hope. Really? Yeah. <laughs> no problem. What, um, what do you like to drink? Is there any type of alcoholic yeah, beverage? I, I, yeah, I, I, I don't like beer, but I like, uh, you know, I drink vodka and, and, and uh, uh, Canadian Club and, and okay. you know, gin. So you might like a sort of a, a zesty, zingy white wine, dry white wine, perhaps like a Riesling uh, that doesn't have a lot of sweetness in it, or maybe just a touch. That's often a great wine to start with. Mm -hmm. Um, But, yeah, see, the the beauty about wine is you can pick it up at any point in your life, and a lot of people do come to it later in life because they've been too busy uh, raising families, work, career, but maybe they've been, you know, in business, entertaining clients, drinking wine, whatever. That's why I think a lot of uh, folks find it easy to pick it up. You don't have to be on a golf course for five hours to yeah. appreciate it. You can start with what you like. You don't have to take that deep dive into the courses and learning right away. And then just take it from, you know, to the level you want. Yeah. Um, do you keep a lot of wine at home? I do. Well, I keep a stash that, you know, would do me in an emergency. Um, <laughs> yeah. I keep about, oh, I guess there's, Around 700 bottles, and mm-hmm. that's a that's a modest size seller for a real 
wine lover. Mm -hmm. There are people who have thousands. Um, but I really, I keep a drinking cellar, so I do age some wines, but I'm not into storing, you know, for decades and yeah. <laughs> bequeathing it to some air. I, you know, my plan is, to have one bottle left in that cellar by the time I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can wine be bought as an investment? I mean, I know it is. Um, do you find that, that it's something that someone can think about doing themselves? Sure. Um, I always advise, though, like, have fun with it and, pardon the pun, but be prepared to drink your liquid assets because yeah. it's not something you want to depend on for retirement or your college, your kid's college tuition. Um, wine prices have consistently risen, and what if you're going to invest, then you are looking at the blue chip wines, the Bordeaux's and the Burgundies and the Tuscan wines, the expensive wines that hold their value and will into the future. So, yeah, it's it's um, I, I it, my strategy if I were going to do that would be just to to do it for fun, the way some people play the stock market for fun. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess we, we need to, to have the, sort of the facilities at home to store it properly, right? Exactly, although there are rental facilities as well. Yeah. You can do that, but, uh, yeah, no, the, the, it's, it's certainly possible. How long can one keep a, a bottle, of, an open bottle of wine <laughs> around the house? Not long in my house, but no. <laughs> um, when uh, it depends on the wine itself, and it depends on how you're going to recork it, because there are those um, sprays you can get, in wine accessory stores and, and some of the liquor stores, they're uh, nitrogen oxide, and they, they take out the oxygen. Oxygen is the enemy of wine. Leave a glass of wine open long enough on the counter, it will turn to vinegar. So if you spray this into the open bottle, then recork it, it's going to keep a lot longer. And it will also keep a, a lot longer if you put it in the fridge because the cold slows down the, the aging process. So if you've got, it depends on how well the wine was made, but, mm -hmm. you know, my rule of thumb is a white wine maybe a day or two, a red wine maybe two or three days at the most. But then it, it also depends on how picky you are, like how fresh do you like your wine to taste. Do you cook a lot with wine? No, I don't cook a lot at all. No. No. <laughs> um, that's uh, one of the skills I didn't pick up with uh, growing up with a single parent mom who was a full-time teacher and so we were doing frozen dinners most of the time, and cooking is just not something I ever got into. I love food and wine pairing because I certainly enjoy eating, yeah. but the cooking aspect is just not part of uh, my daily routine. And how are you with, with uh, foods that have wine in it? I mean, I, I've been to your website, and, and you have sort of the, the food and wine pairings, which, which are just great to watch. And you had one with champagne and potato chips, which you'd never think of, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. I, I love um, dishes with wine. Uh, like a wine reduction sauce yeah. or whatever, because I think they're extremely flavorful, but they're terrific, I think, health-wise, because the, the alcohol does boil off, but you're not using salt and butter so much uh, to get the flavor. You're getting it from the essence of the wine. And so I think it's a wonderfully healthy way to cook and flavorful, too. But going back to the champagne and potato chips, people don't think about these what I call shabby chic combinations, mm -hmm. but... I love that, the high-low pairing. Champagne and, and Kentucky Fried Chicken also works. Mm -hmm. And it's because the, the champagne is a great palate cleanser. It, the bubbles, the acidity, the freshness just clears away the, the fat from the chips and the fried chicken, which is what you want because it makes the next bite taste just almost as good as the first one. Well, we hear a lot of, about organic wines. Um, you know, wines that, that supposedly, and I don't know, is it true that they reduce the risk of some diseases? No, um, organic wines are not in any way a more healthful drink or beverage, and you'll get just as much of a hangover if you drink too much of them. Ah. But the reason why they're a good thing is, of course, the environmental impact is lower. Mm -hmm. But I also find that winemakers who are trying to achieve organic standards in their winemaking and farming are pay paying close attention to the process, and that's what you want in wine. They're really having to understand how their vines are, are growing, is the soil right, and so on, because they can't do a quick chemical fix. And so when I see an organic wine these days, it's a, it's a good indicator um, that the, the winemaker is trying very hard to have an, a natural process but is also just paying attention, which is half the, half the battle in wine. And so it's not a guarantee of a better wine, but it's a guarantee that someone is, is uh, watching closely. Why do you think it is, Natalie, that, that people are so fascinated with wine, and and that like, I mean that 
that there are wine writers like yourself. And, I mean, there are a lot of wine writers in this country and around the world. I mean, are there vodka writers? Are there scotch writers? I mean, <laughs> there are some, uh, yeah. certainly spirit and beer writers. Um, but, you know, surprisingly, there are no orange juice critics. Yeah. Um, I think there's a reason for this. Um, because, to me, wine hits us on three levels. So first there's the intellectual level, if you want that. Um, wine connects to, you know, culture, history, art, science, commerce. You could do a liberal arts degree with wine as the organizing hub. Mm -hmm. Then you've got the sensory level of what does this wine smell like? How is it different from other wines? And what foods does it pair with? And then finally, you've got the alcoholic, hedonistic buzz. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important because it engages us at all three levels, and I think that is the fascination. It, w it was for me because beer and whiskey were part of my Scottish upbringing, but I never developed a taste for them. Wine, though, when I started on it in my late 20s, it was like, wow, something's going on here, and I want to learn more. Yeah. And so, so it, is, it is a day job for you that you do have to taste a bunch of wines during your week, right? Absolutely. I'm yeah. getting to know the uh, FedEx and UPS guys. <laughs> they get a <laughs> case of wine almost every day from wineries or agents. But it's all part of the job is tasting yeah. a lot of wines and, of course, spitting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you seem to be someone who enjoys their work a great deal. I mean, it, it is a good uh, gig. How do you avoid drinking to excess? Um, well, I guess my opinion is um, I love it so much I would never want to have to give it up yeah. for, you know, uh, those kind of reasons. And uh, so I, you know, what, I, I also think that what you know a lot about um, you care about and you're less likely to abuse. So I know so, like, I, I've tried to learn as much as I can about wine. It fascinates me. So I, I, it's not a drink that I want to just sort of knock back like a vodka shooter. Um, and it's something that has become a daily part of my life with dinner and conversation. So because of that, it's a, a kind of a lifestyle thing. I think it's integrated in a more uh, healthful way, and it is the European way. It's not necessarily the North American way, at least traditionally, but it's becoming more so for more North Americans um, to have wine with dinner and, and make it part of uh, a healthy lifestyle. Have you tried making wine yourself? I tried once. It was very grim. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it just did not work. That is tough. It's really yeah. tough to do, even if you get the home wine-making kit, because I just wanted to see how it would go. But you have to keep everything so clean. Any tiny little speck of bacteria or anything can just ruin the whole batch. And, and do people uh, let you taste their homemade wine? Unfortunately, yes. Yeah. Yeah, no, <laughs> they're not all bad. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it's... It's hard, like I think if you love the, the process, like some people like cooking, um, eh, making wine can be a fun hobby. I just think there's so many wines that are so well-priced these days. Certainly for me, it's not worth the effort. Were you surprised at the success of Red, White, and Drunk All Over? Yes. <laughs> I was shocked because it's a wine book. So, yeah. you know, you think, oh, well, you know, there's enthusiasts and some people pick it up and but you know even the whole cookbook food book category is probably 10 times larger than you know the number of readers who read a wine book yeah. and so I was, thr I was absolutely thrilled and uh and now though with the internet has helped to connect me with more people this time it's a much different experience with this book and i was um reading the calgary herald online and it's uh, unquenchable this book has gone to number six on non-fiction bestseller which just blew me away yeah. um, Steve Jobs biography was number four really? <laughs> like wow there are a lot of thirsty people out there but I think the connections are easier to make these days yeah and um, it, I mean it, it as I said I've started reading and I just really enjoyed even though I don't drink wine oh that's that's yeah. the highest compliment yeah. <laughs> you know <laughs> you don't even drink much wine that's great thank yeah. you do you um, oh, what's next for you Natalie well, I'm going to continue touring on, on this book, and it, it's fantastic because, you know, I spent the last five years, other than traveling to the countries, I've been hibernating and writing. And so it's really terrific to get out there and meet wine lovers, people who are as passionate about wine as I am, and, and just have some fun. You know, we're doing wine tastings across the country, and, uh, you know, I'm just uh, kicking back with that for a while before I get down to anything serious again. Yeah, the website's great, as I, I mentioned. Oh, I, thank you. I have a friend who's um, computer savvy in the sort, and he went to it, and he told me um, you can you can uh, uh, scan the barcode on a bottle of wine, and then your review comes up. Exactly.
exactly. That yeah. they're, they're on the mobile apps as well, so iPhone, BlackBerry, Android, and any other smartphone. It'll work. It's just, yeah, because there's so many wines out there. It's a, it's a way of making it easy for people when you're in the liquor store. Instead of trying to search for that bottle, just scan it, and up comes the review. So trying to make it easy, trying to use the tools and technology in a human way that makes it easier to buy wine. Yeah. Natalie, it's been fun talking today. I really enjoyed this book. As I said, good luck with it. Oh, thanks, Joe. This was a great conversation. I really enjoyed it as well, and I invite you and, and your listeners to, to join me at nataliemcclain.com because the more the merrier. Indeed, indeed. nataliemcclain.com is the website. There's the event on the uh, 21st. Uh, visit ticketweb.ca for information on that. The book is called Unquenchable, A Tipsy Quest for the World's Best Bargain Wines. It's published by Doubleday. Its author, Natalie McLean, on the line from here in Vancouver. I'm Joseph Plato.